I welcome all the participants to this uh, second panel of uh, Space and Cultural Heritage, uh, which uh, the second panel will address uh, users and stakeholders, uh, innovative applications and services in the field of cultural heritage. So first I would like to say I'm very happy and honored to moderate this session. I think art and space are closer than what we think, actually. Uh, I have a personal memory of uh, doing uh, zero gravity uh, flights and meeting a ballet dancer who was doing uh, performances in zero gravity. And I tell you, it's not trivial to do ballet in zero gravity. Also, if you remember, we have seen the message uh, sent with the Voyager missions, which included next to mathematical and uh, genetic formula, also a drawing representing two human beings. But now, I think with this event, we are looking at what can space do for art, for cultural, and for our heritage. And this is good, because space is already at the service of research, of transport, connectivity, uh, education, many, many, many areas. We live using, on a daily basis, space-based infrastructure. But space can also be at the service of research, of art, of culture. And space can protect our environment, but space can also protect our cultural heritage. So I think it's very interesting and very innovative what we will hear today. And we have a wide panel uh, which represents many competences which are indeed required to address this subject of space for our cultural heritage. We have representatives from museology, from computer sciences, from space data processing, from archaeology, a very rich panel. So we will have today five uh, panelists, uh, starting with Gabriele Sorrento, uh, CEO Mindesk. Then we will have Professor Sarah Candedine, who works at the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. And then Andrea Radius, uh, co-founder of ICEI, a very innovative uh, startup in space data. Uh, Ariana Travilla, coordinator in the Center for Cultural Heritage Technology, and ending with uh, Frances Conesa, Catalan Institute of Classical Archaeology. So, without further delay, I would like to introduce our first panelist, Gabriele Sorrento. Uh, each panelist will have 12 minutes of intervention, and uh, we will take questions at the end of all the presentations, except for uh, Gabriele, who has to leave us because it's already very late for him. He is in San Francisco, so we make a special thanks to him for attending this panel despite the late hour. So we start with Gabriele Sorrento. Uh, Gabriele is the CEO and co-founder of Mindesk and director at uh, Vection Technologies Limited, a uh, 360 degree partner, helping leading enterprises like Ferrari, Lamborghini, it's almost artistic, and those cars, and Zaha Hadid Architects to boost their design cycle with real-time software. Uh, Gabriele fell in love with computational design at the age of 14. He obtained a master's degree in architectural engineering at the Polytechnic University of Milan, and he studied entrepreneurship at Santa Clara University as a Fulbright Fellow. Today, Gabriele is uh, part of AIASF Design Technology Commission, and he serves as the secretary at San Francisco Computational Design Institute. In 2014, he founded Mindesk, which is a scale-up backed by venture capital and corporate investors like HTC Vivex, and Mindesk was acquired by Vection Technologies in the early 2020s. So, Gabriele, you have the floor. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Geraldine. Um, can I share my monitor so I can uh, move forward with the presentation? Okay, yes. Can you please confirm that you are able to uh, see my monitor? Okay, thank you very much. Yes, we do. So, you already introduced myself, so let me introduce um, 
the company I work for uh, as a director of Action Technologies. Our expertise are in uh, enterprise solution, in particular solution that are powered by digital technologies like augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, real-time rendering, and cloud computing. Um, we have architects, designers, engineers, and students collaborating by leveraging these technologies. And we have the, the honor to work with uh, universities like uh, Philadelphia University, MIT, Cornell, and University of Texas, as well as professionals in the uh, architectural sector like Zadi and Arab. Um, working with, with these uh, universities and uh, with these engineers and architects, uh, we realize that data coming from the space, whether it is uh, satellite data or aerial capture data, is very valuable for the, 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 the innovation and the shaping of our world. In particular, uh, we detected four areas in which this data is fundamental. Uh, the first is environmental planning. Then there is the exploration of the world, especially in a pandemic scenario where traveling is forbidden. And then learning and design. Let me give you and provide some examples. Um, this is a video provided by uh, Google that shows how uh, Google Map and Google Earth collect data from the space to build up a digital world. So, the system combines satellite data and uh, aerial photography together to uh, capture the reality from different angles. And then using um, image recognition and in artificial intelligence combine this uh, image data together to create uh, a representation of the 3D world, which is then clean, re-elaborated, and uh, served as a 3D output. This 3D output can create travel experience that allow you to travel through the world. This is an example where uh, we are exploring the, the, the data of a huge data set um, to explore the city of Rome. Using virtual reality, it's possible to visualize this uh, 3D um, digital twin of the world at full scale or at reduced scale, but also to be completely merged into it. So it's like flying and landing to Rome and exploring the Colosseum. The Colosseum we're seeing is the, the, the structure as it is today. In fact, this database is completely renewed every two years. We can say that each square meter of the planet is being photographed once every hour by satellites and airplanes. And this massive amount of data is then stored in huge database and, and re-elaborated to create this uh, wonderful 3D asset. And the beauty of it is that um, everybody in the world can access this uh, wonderful collection of data and use it for the best purpose. Be able to access our cultural heritage, like, for example, the, the Colosseum, enable us spreading um, consciousness about the beauty and, 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 and the structure and the architecture we possess. And spreading the knowledge and spreading the consciousness is the very first step to preserve this marvelous piece of art. This is just another example, still in Rome, but this applies to uh, any construction, any, ma uh, any manifest in the world uh, and see how it can be explored, visualized and, and experienced in first person alone or, or with other people collaboratively uh, in a journey that can potentially never end.
in particular, the level of detail that this technology offer has reached incredible uh, level and is improving day by day. What we do at Vection Technologies is uh, managing data in a real time to help, um, for example, architectural companies uh, pursuing unprecedented um, tasks in a real time. In particular, uh, we created a platform called Mindesk that is able to synchronize data between CAD software, augmented reality, virtual reality, and external data set like GIS and maps to create a unique environment for design. This is just an example of how we used um, data coming from uh, a scan represented as a point cloud, which in then is used to, to trace uh, three-dimensional shapes. And this, is, uh, this video is representing a process of reverse engineering. So data coming from the real world, like the one we showed before, can be directly inputted in the native CAD software um, to enable uh, the, the construction of uh, reinforcement buildings, and in general, to be the base for uh, future architectural works. This process is extremely faster because um, it waives the current process that involves physical measures and a lot of labors. So by automating all this measuring process, it's possible to um, accelerate the design phase of um, preservation and structural intervention on existing heritage. Thank you very much. If you want to understand more how this um, real-time data can be used in construction and planning, uh, please send me an email or just visit mindeskpr.com. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriele. You have indeed been very sharp with the timing and also thanks for making us dream a bit in those times of confinement, lockdown, of uh, seeing having the joy of seeing Rome again and uh, those uh, beautiful places. I have a question for you. Um, indeed, virtual reality and uh, augmented reality are uh, a key technology for uh, innovative applications in uh, areas which are related to cultural heritage. So could we have your, your standpoint on where they might be most essential and what can we do better or more in terms of space? How can we, the space people, better work with you? Yeah, as I said, uh, for me, the key points are basically two. Uh, the first very uh, important key point is about spreading the knowledge and the existence uh, of, this, uh, of this heritage, because okay, I, I presented two very famous uh, examples but there are, uh, especially in, in Europe, there are endless examples of um, heritage that are not well known and, 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 and risk to be abandoned or overlooked. So creating um, consciousness is the first step. The second step, uh, as we've seen, uh, this data can be used in a meaningful way, even from a technical standpoint. So if we, if a company is starting a preservation project, uh, this huge amount of data set can be, can be used to fulfill the, the first uh, steps of a, of a conceptual design of a renovation project or refurbishment or consolidation. Thank you very much, Gabriele, and I think we can all say a huge thanks for the very interesting presentation and for your presence, and I think you can uh, uh, leave the panel now, if you wish. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you again for this opportunity. Have a great day. 
And now we go to our second speaker, <laughs> Professor Sarah Kandadine. I hope I pronounced uh, properly. Yes. So, um, Sarah, you are uh, lead of the lab Laboratory for Experimental Museology, uh, EM Plus, at the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. And uh, your researchers are at the forefront of interactive and immersive experiences for galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. And indeed, also in these days, it is even more important than uh, it used to be. In, in 2017, you were appointed professor at the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne in Switzerland, where you have built the Laboratory for Experimental Museology, which explores the convergence of cultural heritage, imaging technologies, immersive visualization, visual analytics, digital aesthetics, and cultural big data. You are also director and lead curator of the EPSL Pavilions, formerly Art Lab, which is a new art science initiative blending experimental curatorship and contemporary aesthetics with open science, digital humanism, and emerging technology. So with that, uh, thank you for uh, being our panelist, and I leave you the floor. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Geraldine. Um, everyone can hear me all right? Great. So uh, the ideas that I'm going to discuss today explore the work of the Laboratory for Experimental Museology, as uh, introduced, and uh, M plus engages in research from scientific, artistic, and humanistic perspectives and promotes post cinematic multi sensory engagement using experimental platforms. Our research explores the ways in which mechanistic descriptions of database logic can be replaced and computation can become experiential, spatial, and materialized, embedded and embodied. Indeed, a landscape for the senses. And I've proposed um, a title for this talk, Computational Museology, as a framework that unites, for example, machine learning with data curation and ontology with visualization. For the last 20 years, I've been designing and building large scale immersive um, systems for uh, art and science in museums and galleries across the world. I then started to collaborate with universities to help sustain this kind of infrastructure for the grand sector, for the galleries, libraries, archives, and museums sector, um, using computer science and high end visualization resources within universities to support um, the GLAM endeavor. I created, co developed the Applied Laboratory for Interactive Visualization and Embodiment, which was located at the Science Park in Hong Kong, a thousand square meter laboratory. I then returned to Australia to build the Expanded Perception and Interaction Center at the University of New South Wales. Um, and just to give you an idea what you're looking at here on the right hand side of your screen is a small, seven meter diameter, 360 degree panoramic screen, but it's comprised of 56 projectors and 29 computer cluster. It's 120 million pixels in 3D. So it's at the edge of human visual acuity and was designed to solve visualization problems for complexity and big data in the humanities and the sciences. We did a, an enormous amount of uh, medical uh, big data visualization, phenome network visualization, single molecule science, in which 53 parameters are reduced to 3D spaces. Here, sequences from a molecular dome visualization of proteins found in the blood in the common cold, the rhinovirus magnifies 1 billion times. And now I've moved to, to EPFL to refocus again on cultural heritage, big data, and the immersive visualization technologies. So we have about 12 large scale systems we've designed, and these offer us strategies for multi sensory engagement, emphasizing human to human as well as human to machine interaction, giving us powerful ways to reformulate narrative in a digital context. 
the research that we're doing harnesses technologies that have unprecedented ability to capture the world around us. Laser scanning, for example, collects billions of points, such as these heads at Mount Rushmore, scanned by the Scottish 10. Here, uh, satellite data of Angkor, part of an exhibition that I created in 2004, actually, of stereographic and LIDAR scans um, of, of this site. Um, you can see the barrage here of the water system at Angkor. We can create precious objects in 3D and peer inside to see what was previously unseen. We can capture art in a way that allows us to zoom into the tiniest brush stroke and reveal more than the naked eye can see. And we're using advances in machine learning as an increasing trend in our work. We recently installed the photogrammetric model of Neftari's tomb. It was created with only eight hours of photogrammetry in which machine learning is used to create a model of billions of points. And this model is then transferred to one of our 360 3D environments at 40 million pixels. And it was also the world's first demonstrator of Unreal Engine's end display technology synchronized across a powerful 11 PC graphics cluster. We're also subjecting our cultural treasures to various bombardments. This is X-ray fluorescence from a synchrotron to reveal chemical materiality. Here you see the mercury map of the Henry VIII painting in the collection of the Art Gallery of New South Wales. And one area that I work in a lot is also related to capturing intangible heritage through various forms of motion capture and motion over time analytics. And in the time that we have today, I will just um, briefly show you two examples. They're really at opposite ends of the spectrum of what we are doing. The first of these is a collaboration with the National Museum of Australia, and you'll see why it's important as I go through this narrative. Traveling Kung Karan Galpa is the songline of the Seven Sisters, and it portrays one of the most defining and predominant meta narratives in ancient mainland Australia, and it was never told in the public domain until this exhibition. So it took seven years to um, create the exhibition uh, from the day that the Anagu elders came to the museum to ask for help to put together their broken song lines. And a digital dome was used for this to simultaneously express a sphere of the world around us, the sky above and the ground below, enveloping viewers in depictions of the seven sisters as they travel through country. As these creation beings travel, they leave land formations in their wake, and importantly, the constellations of Pallades and Orion in the southern night sky. And thus it represents a culturally inclusive depiction of the cosmos that should be valued equally as a science of space. The work involved photogrammetry of a sacred cave that had never ever been photographed before, time-lapse photography, drone-based panoramas, gigapixel imaging, ambisonics, allowing visitors intimate views of the stories contained within its sandstone folds. Archaic dome theatres are typified by rock art caves and found throughout Australia. And the theorist Nick Lambert argues that these ancient caves where etchings and paintings were animated by fire and torchlight represent the early beginnings of a cinematic imaginary and are arguably the first immersive experiences of humankind. And throughout the ages, these domed constructions, so typical for planetariums and astrophysics, have often um, being used as surfaces to represent a psychocosmological construct, um, often in this case rendered with incorporeal um, archetypes. The second of the dome journeys immerses visitors in projected artworks of these custodians, telling the story of the Seven Sisters um, as they travel country and in the night sky. In the final scene, three dimensional models of these extraordinary jumpy figures are seen taking flight, prefiguring their final destination as the two constellations. The museum collected these jumpy figures. The artists paint specific um, 
depictions of the narratives, both of the night sky and of the land formations. These are interpreted for us and two um, dome sequences are uh, created um, for this final work. Uh, this is a shot from the opening of this exhibition and it won every major award in 2018 and it's now destined to tour the world to bring this narrative to the world for the first time. Um, so a lengthy seven year gestation led to a watershed in curatorial and indigenous relationships in Australia. And the other great thing about it is we were able to lend our dome to this project for the National Museum and they've gone forward and purchase now their own domes so they can tour it around the world. So the ability to share infrastructure is one of the more important aspects of what we are doing. The second example just quickly is um, derives from EPFL's seminal Morpher Jazz Archive. And Jazz Luminaries is based on the constellations of jazz greats from this archive. The installation cuts, remixes, and replays 5,400 artists and 13,000 videos from a total archive of 11,000 hours. And the neural net image that you see here is based on the social network of artists, and the clustering is based on the numbers of times they played with other artists. So BB King's at the center of the network. Visitors lie under the dome, they use a spherical interface to navigate this constellation, emulating the hemisphere of the full dome in which it's staged. The search paradigm is akin to tuning a radio, searching by listening, and circumvents the lack of public knowledge into who the jazz greats are. And the design unfolds in three layers. And I'll just give you a quick sample of video. <laughs> And just by way of conclusion, um, I'm pleased to say that at the EPFL pavilions in 2022, um, we will create Cosmos Archaeology Space Time Explorations, um, which conjoins art and science in a reconceptualization uh, of the wealth of imaging data coming from um, all sorts of telescopes um, throughout um, the universe. And uh, this is a collaboration with the Lastro Laboratory for Astrophysics at EPFL and my laboratory. And uh, we have been porting the largest known data set of the universe into the systems at my lab in preparation for this exhibition. And alongside that, we will have, um, among other, many other installations, the newly created archive of the Swiss astronaut Claude, Nicol Claude Nicolier, digitized by the Cultural Heritage um, Innovation Center at UPFL. Um, and this will be reframed as a temporal spatial journey from this archive of movie footage and so on um, for the system here. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. This was indeed very inspiring, and uh, again, uh, much much beauty, which uh, is uh, missing uh, a lot. From I mean, we we miss the art and and beauty in those days. And also, I hope the Seven Sisters exhibition will come to Europe eventually, and uh, we will yes. get the chance to see it. It will be in uh, Berlin and also in Paris. Oh, wonderful. Okay. And to, to see also the Cosmos Archaeology uh, yes. uh, exhibition in, in Lausanne, that is uh, also when... something I look forward to. <laughs> I uh, I think I will take questions for you and uh, after the other speakers, if that's okay with you. And therefore, I would like to go to the next speaker, which is uh, Andrea Radius. So Andrea is the ISI co-founder and SAR engineer. Uh, Andrea has a master's thesis in SAR. Uh, SAR stands for Synthetic Aperture Radar uh, Data Processing. It's a typical radar which is installed on uh, space missions. Um, Andrea has also a PhD in moving target detection and 
velocity estimation from SAR raw data. So he has a strong knowledge of remote sensing and SAR and has a great experience working in international environments. He had his PhD in 2008 and he reinforced his technical background in Edisoft and MetaSensing, two companies where he worked for nine years in remote sensing and SAR data processing, uh, gaining even more experience in the scientific retrievals and the product validation starting from Earth observation data. So during these years, uh, Andrea, you have worked in many R&D projects financed by ESA, but also the European Commission Framework Programme for Research, especially in the area of maritime monitoring and interferometry. Finally, after two years spent at UMETSAT, Organization for Meteorological Satellites, uh, which allowed you to acquire global visibility on the end-to-end -end processing change for uh, Earth observation satellites. You are currently working for ISAI in the processing team where you are responsible together with your team for the algorithm definition and implementation and data quality assessment and you work in particular in the area of maritime applications. So you uh, represent really the space data part of the panel. Uh, and I must say myself, having visited uh, ISI before, it is a very impressive uh, company which has developed uh, quite rapidly. So the floor is yours, Andrea. Thank you very much, Geraldine. Uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to be here. Only a precisation. I okay. I am not the co-founder. Uh, okay, I work in, in ISI company only as a, a SAR engineer uh, in the processing team. But I, I represent now the the company. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I now let me introduce the ISI company now. Uh, I say company uh, founded in uh, 2015 is a new actor in the space domain and uh, its target is to build a constellation of microsatellites with expand synthetic aperture radar on board doing the end-to-end -end development in-house. Uh, currently uh, our constellation is constituted by uh, 10 expand star satellites and we expect 12 in orbit in, in, during the, this year. The first satellite has been launched in 2018, so only three years ago. And from 2019, uh, was, uh, was started to, to be launched the operational constellation. Uh, ISAI has a headquarters in Finland and uh, three subsidiaries in Poland, US and uh, UK. And currently uh, more than uh, 230 people work in ISAI. Uh, this is a synthesis of what has been shown uh, and uh, really ISAI had a really fast increasing of the company in a really few years. In, in 2021, uh, the target uh, is uh, to have 12 satellites in orbit uh, that will allow a revisit time of three hours and a global track repeat uh, of one day, enabling a uh, really frequent uh, persistent monitoring. The maximum resolution that we can achieve uh, is uh, 25 centimeters in the azimuth direction along the satellite trajectory. This is a, a synthesis of the characteristics of the main products that we provide. So we provide two types of images, a strip map and spotlight images. And strip map have a coverage of 30 kilometers per 50 kilometers. And the resolution, the ground resolution that we can reach is three meters in the ground range direction and uh, between 2.5 and 3 meters in azimuth resolution. While in spotlight we can achieve a greater 
azimuth resolution uh, uh, to uh, 25 centimeters. So the satellite, uh, uh, the satellite data can be really useful to reduce the risk uh, uh, to which the cultural heritage is subjected. Uh, for example, uh, we can have uh, um, subsidence and ground motion, indiscriminate urban sprawl, looting, climate change, and uh, natural disasters. And all uh, these characteristics can be monitored uh, by uh, space data. Uh, ISI uh, provide, aims to provide the reliable and high quality services uh, that can benefit from the persistent high resolution capability allowed by all the satellites of the constellation. Uh, this will allow to fill the existing gaps in terms of temporal resolution using really a huge constellation. Uh, interesting is the benefit that the cultural heritage management could have using space data, and this requires a big effort of synergy between institutional management and space data actors. The SAR, uh, Synthetic Aperture Radar, uh, is an active uh, sensor uh, working uh, at microwave uh, in microwave band and uh, is able to acquire data in all uh, weather conditions during day and night. It measures uh, amplitude and phase of the signal that is backscattering, backscattered from the surface. And amplitude is related to the amount of energy that uh, the surface backscatters toward the sensor. And the phase is relative to the propagation uh, delay of the signal. The advantage of the SAR, uh, okay, are many, and particularly the distance measurement capability allows the application of techniques dedicated to deformation monitoring at millimetric scale. That could be really useful, of course, in this uh, area. And the strong interaction with the man-made structures that allows an accurate land use monitoring. The techniques uh, that we identify as really useful for cultural heritage monitoring are the interferometry and the change detection that can be performed over images acquired in similar geometrical conditions. The concept is similar to the stereometry. Uh, the interferometry is used uh, generally to generate uh, topographic map maps and to monitor ground deformation and surface motion while the change detection is used to identify changes occurred in the monitored area of interest uh, between the dates uh, of acquisition. The interferometry and coherent change detection use, use also the phase information, while the incoherent change detection uses uh, the amplitude information. Uh, the big amount of data that are acquired during the time can be easily managed by machine learning techniques able to work with a huge amount of data, optimizing the useful information and enabling faster response to minimize the damages. The SAR data can be used uh, for many applications in the field, in the field of cultural heritage. The main identified applications are, for example, in this case, uh, subsidence and uh, ground motion, damage assessment, surveillance, urban sprawl monitoring, uh, and general land use monitoring, natural disaster monitoring, detection, for example, of new archaeological areas also is an interesting application, and security using a really high resolution images. Now I'll show you some examples of our uh, products and uh, that could be useful for uh, this type of application. Here uh, you can see the Giza pyramids uh, and particularly uh, after uh, running the interferometry and uh, interferometric and uh, change detection techniques, we can have an idea about uh, the, the information that the phase is able to, to provide and the coherence. So in this case, for example, uh, the face showed 
the ability to uh, to build a digital elevation model, for example, of the pyramids, while the uh, coherent uh, change detection is able to, uh, to to identify all the changes occurred in uh, the on monitored area. This is another uh, detail of that. Here we have uh, an image of El Cairo city in e Egypt uh, with really big buildings and the presidential palace in construction. This is an example of the city of London uh, with its skyline that is possible to see uh, along the river. This is a suggestive image of Dubai with uh, the famous palm shape. This is uh, uh, some detail uh, about the landmark uh, 81 tower in Ho Chi Minh. And this is uh, useful to see the level of detail that you can have from uh, such images with really high resolution. And finally, uh, this is an image uh, that shows the details of Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Thank you very much. And uh, if uh, there are questions, I am really happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. And indeed, uh, we can get already a good feeling of um, what space uh, the video on what uh, space uh, data can bring. And indeed, uh, this is uh, very interesting to see that ISI is also working on that. Okay, we will take questions, as I said, at the end of the session. And, and therefore, I will ask our next panelist, which is uh, Ariana Traviglia. Uh, she is the coordinator of the Center for Cultural Heritage Technology based in uh, Venice part of the Italian Institute of Technology uh, Network. So uh, she's an adjunct professor in computing applications to archaeology and cultural heritage, starting from 2003 at the University Cath Foscari. Uh, she has held uh, positions at the postdoc and research fellow at the University of Sydney and at uh, Marquery University. Uh, from 2006 to 2015, and she has re-entered the European Academia as recipient of a Marie Curie Fellowship in 2015. Her research is at the intersection of information management and humanities, and most of her work focuses on mediating the inclusion of digital technology within the study and management of cultural heritage. So we are really at the core of our panel today. Um, she has an academic background in archaeology and geomatics, and she is an internationally recognized specialist in landscape archaeology. In the past 10 years, she has undertaken extensive processing of satellite, multispectral and airborne hyperspectral imagery to establish their effectiveness for archaeological investigation. Uh, she has pioneered the adoption of procedures from environmental disciplines and identifying specific image processes that enable the identification of archaeological sites hidden by vegetation or topsoil. Uh, she is part of the Executive Steering Committee of the International Computer Application and Quantitative Methods in Archaeology Association co-editor of the Journal of Computer Application in Archaeology, and she chaired a number of sessions on several aspects of digital applications to archaeology major international conferences. So, Ariana, with that, I leave the floor to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. So, good morning and thank you very much uh, for having me here today. Um, so, um, I'm, I'm very grateful for this uh, invitation, especially for being in, in, this, uh, in this panel in such a good company. Um, so from the example that uh, we have seen this morning and the ones that we will see just after me actually, it, it is clear that the use of uh, um, earth observation for the safeguarding and protecting cultural heritage has by now reached a, a certain level of maturity, but 
it is clear also that uh, part of this potential is still to be unleashed uh, completely. And looking at, at the broader picture, we, we all know that I've seen um, that the so-called uh, space verticals have a crucial role to play in the landscape management domain as technological enables, and that they can be used at, at the core of a cost effective management model for both the urban and, and the rural landscape. But the way in which this can be fully extended to cultural heritage and cultural heritage and cultural landscape is not always still clear. So I hope to be able to demonstrate that um, in my brief talk today and show also how heritage observation used for cultural heritage detection and, and monitoring managing can be also not only useful for cultural heritage management and, and managers and, and cultural govern, local government, but also to deliver better solution for the protection of, of cultural heritage. So, a step back, and you have briefly introduced this before, what um, um, uh, I'm speaking about today is a very specific use of uh, earth observation data to detect buried cultural heritage sites, which is cultural heritage sites that are still under the surface or subsurface or covered by vegetation and have not been excavated yet, and therefore are not discovered. And these type of sites normally receive very little attention and therefore protection because they are considered to be only tentative sites. So for quite a long time now, remote sensing using aerial and satellite data has been used by archaeologists and cultural heritage experts to detect un unknown archaeological sites still um, lying under the soil. And detection for archaeologists is not just the pinpointing activity, meaning that it's not just putting a dot on a map. Uh, what archaeologists and cultural heritage experts do, uh, since they are, have users of a geographical information system, they normally store in GIS the nature and the attributes of the archaeological features that they have identified via um, AO data. And the GIS is then used to handle the complexity of the data that is necessary to uh, correctly interpret the features that have been detected through the EO data. So uh, it is just the, the whole amount of this information that make possible to archaeologists to decode the trace, which means to understand what type of archaeological size is the one that has been detected. And this goes well beyond detecting a shape, which normally corresponds to a crop mark or an earthwork on, on EO data. It's, there is a lot of interpretive work in what the archaeologists have to do. So the possibilities provided by GIS in mapping and tagging the hypothetical archaeological objects that have been detected uh, from EO data in, in a single system um, enable the remote sensing archaeologists to create the overview maps that can be then further elaborated and become uh, archaeological risk assessment maps uh, similar to the environmental risk assessment maps that are based completely on EO remote identification. And clearly, these, these maps can become very powerful instruments in the hands of cultural heritage managers for cultural heritage protection. And the benefit of using EO data to get this type of results are quite clear. Uh, so they provide the capacity to check large blocks of landscape to identify these unknown archaeological remains in a very limited time. And this uh, speed up incredibly the uh, regular uh, ground survey procedures that normally the archaeologists uh, archaeologist adopt. And in the last years, to this advantage of uh, pinpointing uh, a, a new location for new archaeological sites, we have seen also a, another ability that has been provided through platforms like Copernicus, because now we can we have the availability of systematic EO data time series. And these are for us a game changer because they enable to check tentative archaeological sites over different seasons and environmental conditions. And this reduce uh, from one side the wrong detections of when we think that we have identified archaeological sites, but it's something completely different. And they also um, reduce the further fieldwork activities that are normally necessary to archaeologists to validate these traces. And they also 
uh, create uh, provides an, another advantage uh, because uh, we can use the time series to check over time and monitor um, what we think are archaeological sites so that we can check if they are treated by anthropological or natural hazards. And uh, most of all, the DO data series can provide us with uh, crucial information for the landscape planning. And this is a really a, a real crucial point because it has to do not only with identifying new archaeological sites, but really protect them in the frame of landscape planning together with uh, you know, bringing together not only um, archaeologists but also people that are in charge of landscape management. And in fact, EO data and particularly the, the time series can be used to provide all the background information that the uh, regional and national authorities re needs, really need for um, landscape planning. Let's think about the creation of small scale or large scale infrastructures and how they can be impacted by uh, the fortuitous discovery of a buried archaeological site. This happens very, very often, especially in uh, European countries that are so rich in, in cultural heritage. The systematic use of EO data for the detection of cultural heritage sites can prevent these adverse impacts during landscape development phases. As uh, the archaeological risk can actually be taken into account already in the planning phase and, and, and planning can be done based on all the available archaeological information. And in this sense, the use of EO data enables a more accurate landscape design and, and the integration of landscape aspects in the spatial planning and in, in the development process of, of a territory and increase clearly also the protection of this uh, cultural heritage site. In front of this enormous potential, however, uh, what we can see is that it's not always available uh, and it's not always possible to integrate the information that we are able to create through EO data with the existing planning instruments that are used at a local level, like for example, the landscape plan or the local strategic plans. And this is uh, most of the time do, well, except uh, in a few cases, due to a lack of dedicated space within these instruments for this type of information that is still seen as very volatile. And, you know, a trace detected from remote sensing is still seen something that is still not yet a, a cultural heritage site to preserve. Um, so basically what happens is that uh, within the information system that most of the local governments use for landscape pl planning, there is a, not a specific layer, in, you know, layer in a GIS uh, mini that is dedicated to archaeological risk. And uh, uh, because in most of these instruments, only, only cultural heritage is uh, already out of the ground, so already excavated, is protected. And we can only hope that in, in the near future, the local governments and cultural heritage managers will, have a, uh, will be able to accommodate more information from remote sensing as they can be uh, really, uh, they can be a very effective source of information to support uh, um, in preventing risk and mitigating consequences from both of the physical consequences like the damaging or therefore the destruction or the loss of cultural heritage sites that are still um, uh, under soil and also the economic ones because for example the cost of modifying a development plan that has already uh, started is much higher than modifying it when it's still at the design phase so there is a very strong economical advantage for um, uh, local governments and cultural heritage managers to adopt these technologies in advance so that they can better check the uh, terrain where there is going to be um, some sort of development and they can avoid loss of time and, uh, and of course of, of money. Uh, one of the best best practices that I, I personally know uh, of the use of remote sensing data um, comes from Scotland, the historic environment Scotland. In here all the data produced not only by ground survey of archaeologists but also from remote sensing observation is incorporating within the national record of the historic environment Environment, which is then available to everybody through an online portal. And the expectation in Scotland, the standard practice is that any development control activity will consult 
the uh, NRHI uh, together with other instruments like the historic uh, environment records and, and take account of them. So even take account of the remote, the remote sensing identification when planning the development of new infrastructure, of new buildings and so on. So this is a very important use of the EO data. To make the most of EO data, it is also crucial that local and national government agencies create or where they already have them improve their digital infrastructure for uh, integrating in a very organic way EO derived information. And they should be also started to treat more as any other indicator that should be kept into consideration when, when planning or when managing the, the territories to actively safeguard still buried archaeological sites. And, and this means primarily to fully include these archaeological risk maps that we are able already to obtain through EO data in the regional and national landscape plans. And, and finally, looking at the future, and it has been also um, already mentioned from um, the speakers before me, uh, there, we, have, we are seeing very rapid changes uh, in the domain of remote sensing and cultural heritage because what was uh, we used to do visually on photographs on, or on screen by it was done by normally by photo cultural heritage photo interpreters is now progressively being done automatically by machines thanks to the rapid advancement enabled by the use of AI. And the next year, with, with the progressing of this technology, the detection and the monitoring of cultural heritage sites will become much easier as it will be done automatically. And I, I take here the opportunity here to mention, for example, a recently launched research project of my center in collaboration with the European Space Agency to automate the detection of cultural heritage features on imagery from Copernicus platform via um, artificial intelligence and the acceleration that we know is obtainable via AI will enable in the future uh, cultural heritage managers and local governments to have plenty of information to better manage their their cultural their cultural landscape so to sum up my position I'm really looking forward to uh, the future that is coming of EO data and the future integration of EO data derived information for cultural heritage in all the instruments that are available to cultural heritage managers and local government, like, for example, land use planning, landscape planning, impact assessment. And most of all, more broadly, I'm looking forward to the integration of EO data in the decision making uh, process related to cultural landscape management as I strongly believe this is the only way we can really preserve our cultural landscape for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this was uh, very interesting. And also, I think you, you rightfully uh, make, a, let's say, a, a call for using better and more uh, Earth observation data for the, let's say, the, the identification, but also the, the protection of our of our sites <clears throat> and also the limits, but mostly the benefits of, of this data. So thank you very much. And I think we can now go to our last, not least speaker, Frances Conesa. Uh, uh, so um, Frances is a, is a postdoc research fellow at uh, the Landscape Archaeological research group in the Catalan Institute of Classical Archaeology. Uh, his research uh, focuses on the development of new multi-source remote sensing procedures, coupled with machine learning and deep learning methods, which can help and improve the detection, identification, mapping, and quantification of features of archaeological interest. So, um, uh, your broad interests, uh, Francesc, focus on the natural and anthropic relationships that define cultural landscapes, including aspects such as the long-term ecological footprint, past land use, and present-day endangered cultural heritage. You have conducted research and field explorations in a diverse range of archaeological contexts and ecological settings, such as South Asia, Mediterranean region, North Africa, Sahara, Central Asia, and more recently, Mongolia. 
So your research combines uh, historical data, multispectral and radar Earth observation data, and geoarchaeological proxies from soil and sediment. You have uh, completed the Marie Curie uh, Fellowship, in which you have developed new workflows for the accurate identification of landscape features of archaeological and paleo-environmental interest using multi-sensor, multi-petabyte satellite imagery in cloud computing platforms. So, Frances, uh, please go ahead, and after your intervention, we shall then go to questions. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Geraldine, and hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting us to be here today uh, in such an inspiring uh, workshop. Uh, now, we are uh, going to move uh, now to more uh, remote applications for archaeological research, as this contribution uh, will focus on the use of uh, Sentinel data for the detection and monitoring of endangered archaeological sites uh, at large or even at global scales. So uh, we will see what remote sensing has to offer here uh, while showcasing two applications uh, we've been working on uh, recently uh, under the coordination of Hector Orengo and also Arnau Garcia Muzosa. So I will not uh, enter into many archaeological details, uh, but with these two examples that I'm showing today, uh, just we want to highlight the potential of using Copernicus data while we draw some perspective and directions uh, to be addressed during the discussion of the panel. Uh, in many ways, the degree to which we can identify, study, and protect archaeological sites, and also the, the cultural landscapes that they are part of, is intrinsically related to the nature and extent of several dynamics, and I will say uh, stories of past and present land use. And we all agree here that the intensification of human activities uh, aggravates the preservation of many archaeological and cultural heritage sites. At at least within academia, there is now a consolidated and global will to use remote sensing and as an essential tool to investigate heritage at risk. And we have seen uh, many examples today, uh, starting from uh, the presentation of Felix Mahon about the, how law prosecution is working on that. Uh, Professor Giorgio Polo, Valerie, and also Adriana uh, presented cases in which we use remote sensing to understand and mitigate uh, the impact produced by uh, many, uh, many human activities. And unfortunately, there's a complex and large scale looting that will be one of the uh, trending topics now, uh, among several others. So, uh, what is new? Uh, I think that uh, not long ago, uh, we had poorly satellite coverage uh, and limited temporal and spatial resolution. And that was the general norm, in, especially in remote or marginal regions. Uh, but things are moving fast. Uh, and these limitations are changing thanks to uh, the availability of global mid-resolution missions, such as the Sentinels, uh, of course, and the increasing availability of high-resolution imagery, uh, for example, from constellations of miniature satellites, such as the one operated by Planet, and, for example, the ones presented by Andrea today, the miniature uh, radar eyes satellites. Uh, and moreover, and I want to highlight that one in particular, uh, we have now the ability to work with uh, big Earth data in cloud computing environments, such as the ESA platforms for data and information access services, or for the examples that I'm showing today, uh, the Google Earth Engine platform. Using uh, Earth Engine, uh, might have its own advantage and limitations, but I take this platform uh, to highlight two key aspects of cloud computing that might be long consolidated in other fields, but the implementation is just becoming stronger in archaeological uh, applications. The first one is the facility to develop a code-based approach, thus ensuring that uh, both data and algorithms can be shared to other experts or to the broad community of data users. And I think this uh, aspect is a game sheet uh, scenario uh, as we all push towards open science and reproducible uh, research environments. The other one, and perhaps even more relevant, is the synergistic use of free and open multi-source collections. Now, nowadays, uh, we do not work, or we work, but uh, we don't use a single or a limited bunch of satellite scenes uh, that we need to download, uh, store, and analyze using costly uh, computational uh, resource. 
but instead uh, we access, process, and visualize all the data on the cloud while fully integrating large multi-temporal uh, data sets from different sensors and different scales of observation. But let's uh, better show what the Sentinels can do together uh, you know, with our first case study. We've been working mostly on the semi-arid desert plains of East Pakistan and Northwest of India in what was the core of the Indus civilization. Now, uh, most of the archeologists who are attending this workshop will know that uh, very well, but the most prominent archeological features are the tells or mounds those were past urban settlements back to, that go back to 5,000 years ago. And what you see here in the picture, uh, this is Mohenjo Daro, one of the uh, finest Hindu cities on a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So here the air mound uh, that indicates uh, the former extension of the city have been uh, partially excavated. But Mohenjo Daro, it's just an exception really, because uh, many similar mounds are not excavated or documented at all. And actually, uh, what we see if we walk around uh, many of them, uh, it's just an elevation on a slight elevation made of accumulated debris, such as mud bricks and uh, pottery shards scattered uh, through the surface. So mounds are ubiquitous in other old world civilizations, such as uh, Egypt or Mesopotamia. And uh, the well-preserved ones, at least, uh, have a specific soil color and texture properties. This say it might uh, take time and resource to properly identify a mound as they are usually uh, spread over thousands of square kilometers and many coordinates for the ones that were surveyed in the past uh, might be inaccurate. And moreover, several of them are affected by erosion or other uh, land use activities. Uh, so the idea is, okay, how we can uh, work uh, around that. And and moreover, in many instances, uh, if we use a single sensor or, or a scene, uh, my, this might not be enough to distinguish between uh, soil or texture properties, or it might easily lead uh, to false positive uh, identifications. But the point is, what if uh, we combine information from both movie spectral and radar imagery? Uh, by doing this, we might find specific signatures for archaeological mounds if we add, if we add additional multispectral bands as well as texture information coming from the radar backscatter, while also adding information on the short to long-term environmental conditions around the site. And this is something that was uh, pointed out also by Ariana Traviglia. So with uh, this in mind, we applied a pixel-based uh, random forest classification over a multi-temporal image composite made by thousands, almost uh, the, all the entire scenes available uh, of Sentinel-1 and cloud filtered uh, Sentinel-2 scenes. And that resulted in a probability map of moon-like surface in a large area of thousands of square kilometers. Uh, so just to show you some of uh, our results, um, what I'm displaying now is an example of the Cholistan Desert in Pakistan. And thanks to this approach, what was before a virtually uh, empty desert, at least in, in terms of archaeological features, uh, turned out to be a rich archaeological landscape um, with hundreds of these small uh, dots that might be potential archaeological mounds. Or to say the least, uh, we have now hundreds of locations with a high probability of being uh, archaeological sites. Most of these uh, newly detected mounds were not known so far, and their distribution largely expands uh, what we expected. Uh, so this obviously has uh, several archaeological implications. Uh, not moreover that the algorithm uh, was able to identify mounds that are large that are hardly seen in base map uh, imagery. So what we call uh, the naked eye in aerial archaeology or that are largely buried under sand dunes, uh, having only small visible surface uh, towards the edge of the regional mound. While uh, we are now testing the suitability of this algorithm to expand the mound detection in other uh, drylands, and you see here examples of uh, locations from Syria, uh, where the algorithm was also able to distinguish between uh, the archaeological mounds or the, the proper, say, uh, archaeological uh, surface 
uh, and that was different from the present day village uh, built around them. So we think we can uh, move also to uh, a more global uh, scale. But if we go back now to the uh, Cholistan Desert in Pakistan, it, it provides also an ideal scenario to test our second approach. Uh, many archaeological mounds were preserved in fairly good condition uh, in the desert boundary that match the traditional irrigated lands on the Indus River. And for decades, desert lands have been gradually converted into irrigation fields with the spread of irrigation canals. But all the lands uh, rank in February last year when large areas of the Cholistan Desert were put under irrigation for the first time. So we were wondering uh, whether we could have a tool to automatically monitor the spatial trends of agricultural expansion in the area in order to evaluate uh, its impact on the archaeological uh, locations. And in here, we design a multi-temporal workflow uh, that is based on annually, seasonally, or monthly vegetation change by means of Sentinel-2 multispectral indexes. Uh, given the sudden response in healthy vegetation that are produced by new crops at the specific locations uh, when before there was just a bare soil, sand or archaeological surface with almost no vegetation cover. We are not uh, using a deep learning or machine learning approach here as sometimes I will say uh, simplicity just works fine. Uh, the overall idea is that for each input mount or location we can systematically monitor uh, the advance and the turning of agriculture. So there is some uh, croplands that might have encroached uh, archeological surface within a specific buffer or protected area around the sign. So it turns an updated uh, endangered, uh, endangered database. A particular interesting Feature here is also that uh, Earth Engine also returns a set of uh, spatial indicators, such as the percentage of the total endangered area, together with uh, time indicators on when this phenomena started, without the need of going to uh, GIS software or, or external tools for more uh, zonal statistics. We are just Turning this algorithm at its full capacity now, uh, but we think that it can provide critical data uh, to evaluate uh, task priority actions, such, that, such as the ground truth surveys to focus on the more damaged mounds, as well as to inform heritage stakeholders working on the area. And I don't know if I'm out of time now, but as our final remarks, uh, I would just mention that uh, behind all this computational approach being presented here, there is a research need, uh, at least for us archaeologists, to systemize and automatize our remote workflows for site detection and monitoring. So we can really work or focus into our other jobs, and that will be the ground through validation, the excavation, and the site interpretation. At this site, we have now better tools to share and disseminate our workflows and results. That's reaching out to more colleagues and heritage practitioners. And finally, and I just leave it here for some ideas for potential discussion, just in case we need to come back here. Uh, for example, I'm interested in the multi source integration of air observation data, which is closely linked to the concept of virtual constellations, which I'm sure most of the audience is familiar with. The harmonized integration of sensors with similar attributes or even with different principles, such as in the case of radar and multispectral data, uh, also falls in line with current agendas for archaeological research. And lastly, we are always uh, likely to need very high resolution data from uh, different third party providers. So perhaps we want to explore uh, directions and opportunities for that. And that will be all from my side. So uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, uh, Francesc, for this uh, last intervention. I am, I am quite impressed with all the possibilities that you have presented to us. And also, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to see if indeed uh, we will uh, find so many sites of uh, interest uh, through the mounts that can be identified uh, thanks to Earth observation data, but also how to better protect them.
Okay, we have a bunch of questions. We have uh, almost 15 minutes for questions. So uh, I would like to start with a, a question to Professor Kandertine. Uh, it comes from the audience. There was a question on whether you could specify if and how satellite data, uh, be it imagery or navigation or whatever, were, was used in the projects you illustrated, or also if you used any space-based uh, uh, system. Sure. Um, the project that I mentioned briefly when I showed the um, NASA satellite image of Angkor in Cambodia, um, this was used in conjunction also with LIDAR data that came from the uh, Greater Angkor project, which was a remote sensing project to look at the whole hydrology of, uh, of Angkor. Um, a greater anchor and to prove in fact that the the civilization was much 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 bigger almost 12 times bigger than had originally been um, estimated and uh, these uh, imaging data sets were used in collaboration or in conjunction with 3d stereoscopic panoramic images done on the site itself of various temples and temple complexes uh, and uh, so this was all brought together in a new aesthetic framework i guess that allowed you to travel between these uh, different um, uh, zoom levels if you like from 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 satellite data right down to um, to image data of temples, um, all in 3D. Uh, so that's how it was used, and it was a, a project done for Museum Victoria. Uh, it was an eight-sided rear projected stereographic system, um, and it was the world's first stereographic um, capture of any World Heritage site. So panoramic capture. So. That was how it was used in that particular instance. There are numerous opportunities to create new aesthetic frameworks by bringing together these different ways of seeing. And I think that's the grand challenge for us as we begin to communicate with the public is how we meld these materials together in the creation of these new experiences. And that's, that's the fun bit. Actually, yeah. Uh, it's just um, indeed that many of the things you have uh, shown uh, show the possibility of uh, using advanced technology to uh, allow people to visit uh, sites remotely. Uh, uh, there was a question asked, is there any particular effort nowadays due to the pandemic? Is it yeah, more sure. uh, used nowadays? S so I certainly think there's almost been a renaissance of the digital um, in the cultural sector as the power of digital imaging and its reuse potential and its distributed access has come into the fore. What hasn't happened yet and is that the experiments that we did in the 90s with websites, with data, all this kind of thing, we're really, really experimental, and we don't yet see that being taken up in the cultural sector now. Making virtual worlds and putting them online is one thing, but what are the new strategies? Um, and one of the strategies that I'm working on and I'm about to appoint a PhD in is related to um, drone-based access, both of World Heritage Sites and of museums, um, so blimps in museum case, which can be remotely accessed and flown around inside closed galleries um, or open galleries for that matter. So the artificial intelligence of these systems is it's now entirely possible to do this in a safe way, both for participants and for the artworks. And the other one is uh, really addressing the heritage at risk issue um, of mass visitation to World Heritage Sites of the ability to look, for instance, at the at the faces of the Bayonne in Angkor, um, you can have a very smart drone that you um, fly there yourself and in collaboration with the um, NCCR and robotics and EPFL um, professor in robotics, Dario Floriano, uh, he has just produced a haptic jacket which you put on and you're able to uh, fly your own drone essentially 
So we're looking at a project in the Middle East to fly um, your own drone using this haptic jacket all over a World Heritage Site safely, securely, but with unprecedented access opportunities. 5G, of course, is essential to all of these um, developments. Thank you very much. It's, uh, yes, indeed, it's at least one can say that the, the effect of this uh, pandemic is indeed that many uh, sites which were at risk are at least not been harmed further by massive uh, human uh, uh, visits. Which yes. I, I know the case. We have several caves in France where um, we had to install uh, new digital caves to avoid yeah. Effects like in last Absolutely, year. indeed. Um, I have a question for Andrea uh, from the audience as well, which is uh, first a remark that uh, indeed the uh, high resolution uh, commercial data cost is really high for most archaeological projects. So, is there a way to make it more uh, affordable? Um, and also, an, another question. Uh, uh, can your data, which is linked in a way to the previous question on how to make it more affordable, is can uh, some of your data at least be accessed for research purposes? Andrea. Yes, uh, there is an interesting, okay, there are many possibilities to take our data uh, for free, for example, and one of them is uh, uh, ISI now is a third party mission. So it means that uh, it is possible to submit to ESA a proposal and if accepted, um, it is possible to, uh, to use uh, ISI data uh, from this program. So this uh, of course is uh, one possibility. I think that is uh, the best possibility. Uh, Anyway, if someone wants to have a look to our data, in archive uh, there are uh, many uh, many data available data, so this uh, could be interesting for someone. Uh, but I encourage to uh, to submit some uh, a proposal uh, because this is a really an interesting uh, topic uh, to Hisa uh, to have. I cite data a resolution for free. Okay, thank you very much. And I have now a question for Ariana and Frances, actually, uh, from the audience as well. Uh, is it possible to use the satellite data for visualizing microtopography of large areas, uh, similar to how you can use the uh, airborne lidar? To detect uh, previously uh, unknown archaeological sites. So, uh, Ariana, Francesca, I don't know how you want to handle this. Perhaps, Ariana, you start? Yeah, it, it's all a matter of a resolution. Basically, it is possible, but certainly we can have much better resolution using drones and uh, um, and the airborne sensors uh, to look at micro topography clearly. But yes, even using satellite, the new generation satellite imagery data, uh, it, it can it can be done. And I'm sure that in the next five to 10 years, the, with the increasing the amelioration of the technology, mm. we will be able to get data at a much better resolution, even from satellites. Yeah. I I Thank you, more. Francesc, you want to add something? I have also a question for you, Francesc, but go ahead, please. Yeah, no, no, I couldn't agree more with Adriana. It's all a matter of resolution and what's available and in mystic areas. But I think we are all quite excited about the new uh, LiDAR mounted on UAB platforms. Uh, so yeah, that would be the next step, I guess, which is already happening. So I have a question for you also, since you addressed uh, mounds indeed. Um, a question from the audience. Uh, how different is it to study a plain area versus a more heavy landscape with space imagery? Okay, I think it all depends on the, the future of interest that you want to detect and the, and the property, the soil properties, the texture properties, the, the size. And for that, you have different 
uh, approach, right? So, uh, for example, in our area, we also have the uh, monsoonal season, so almost two years of cloudy coverage. So that's why also radar data was quite useful. And also in the morning, uh, Professor Georgiopoulou was also showing examples of how using LIDAR, even if it's airborne, not uh, satellite, uh, that has been applied in uh, Central American jungles, for example. Uh, so with, uh, I think I, I am also quite, uh, how do I say that? Uh, you, you need to, to be sure that uh, the properties that you can use for the, the training data of your models have some uh, unique signatures. Uh, and that's why uh, I think the integration of these different multi-sensor and layers uh, can help you in that. And, and uh, perhaps the last question uh, for you is, um, do you have uh, specific needs for our Sentinel-based uh, applications for the detection and monitoring of cultural heritage sites? If And if so, what are those specific needs? Is that, oh, can you repeat, please? Sorry. Sure, sorry, I, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so the question was, uh, but also by the way, uh, the question can go for uh, many of you. Uh, do you have specific needs for our, let's say, you know, European Earth Observation Satellites, the Sentinels, which are used for environmental monitoring, as you know, yeah. Do you have needs for Sentinel applications for the automated detection and monitoring of the cultural heritage sites? Uh, is there something better or more that we uh, can do? Well, I already think that Sentinels represent a step for war, as they are uh, free to, to use and they have they have uh, global availability. And they are integrated in many of these cloud computing platforms, such as Earth Engine and many others. So I think that we're pushing towards that uh, direction. Probably um, more resolution will be uh, the next step or even more uh, multispectral ones in that range, right? Uh, yes. yes, of course, more resolution, better resolution, more multispectral. But we have the high priority yeah. candidate missions for the future computer satellites, which will provide such uh, features. Ariana, did you want to did you want to add something, maybe? Uh, no, he said exactly what I had in mind. More resolution. We need to increase the resolution. Although there are certain techniques of super resolution that they are making now easier to use the uh, imagery from Sentinel two. Uh, going toward better resolution is essential for specific type of archaeological features because at the moment with Sentinel we can detect only large features because the ground resolution is not there clearly and or we can monitor um, features that we already know are there so the detection by itself is a little bit hard so definitely the resolution the other thing is the coverage of multispectral bands if we could increase going toward more a, a sort of hyperspectral approach rather than a multispectral and increase the number of bands that we need for specific type of processing like the vegetation indices the soil indexes or right. other type of indices that will increase incredibly our capacity of uh, of um, detecting new archaeological features but yeah we, we know that is coming we just have to wait i guess okay so thank you thank you for your replies i see that it is exactly 1300 so i'm afraid we have to stop myself i could have gone on i have other questions so i could have continued for <laughs> not hours but yes i think hours uh, the subject is is really fascinating and i've, I've learned a lot so i must say Thank you to all of you. I think on behalf of all the attendees, I see we have kept high attendance despite the, the lunch hour. So this is a very good sign that you have all been very interesting and uh, kept a good interest of the audience. Thanks again. Um, and uh, with that, we finish our session. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank Bye. You. Thank you again. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you all the all the speakers and all the attendees for this other very interesting session. Just a few words. We are going to interrupt for lunchtime. Uh, the day is not over. 
We are having a, a final session at 2.30 and you are going to learn more about how ISA is supporting cultural heritage with our colleagues presenting the ongoing and future activities. Thank you all again and have a nice day. And thank you.